this afternoon. I'm Steve Clark and welcome to a very special Armistice Day celebration. Very warm welcome to, well, warm welcome to our guests as well this evening. It's good to see you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, four years ago on August the 21st I stood here and introduced Kate Lady, uh, the journalist and broadcaster who came along at the start of the uh, Great War to talk about the changes of the community and especially the effects on women. And now we are four years later, I can't believe it, four long but short years, we're here to celebrate the end of that war. I booked this event 12 months ago, and I admit that we had no idea what the content should be. But we knew it had to be different, and we knew it had to be about people. During those 12 months, we've met some fantastic people along the way, and some of those people you're going to see this afternoon. The Great War for Civilization changed the world forever, and we are a legacy of that change. We're not only here to remember the fallen, but the millions who died of the flu pandemic that followed, and those that are left behind with horrendous injuries. I make no, whether I'll get through this or not, I don't know, but I make no apology for being emotional. A hundred years ago today, my grandfather, thanks to the Kaiser, was in a German prisoner of war camp. I was delighted about that because it gave me 13 years in which I got to know and love him. He died at the age of just 69. It's a photograph of him at the back as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, we need to reflect on those thoughts and try and imagine what the world would have been like 100 years ago. This very room would have paid a silent witness to that age and witnessed that fact. So to start things off, I'd like to welcome two very special people, Jenny Lockyer and Vern Griffiths, who were here early in the year with their one-person play about Amy Johnson. Please welcome Jenny Locke here and Vern Griffiths. Hello. Thank you very much for having us. Um, it's pretty wonderful in here at the moment. There's a lovely atmosphere. Um, looking forward to being part of it. Um, we're going to read some poems for you this afternoon. Um, this is the first one. This is called For the Fallen by Lawrence Binion. With proud thanksgiving, a mother for her children, England mourns for her dead across the sea. Flesh of her flesh they were, spirit of her spirit, fallen in the cause of the free. Solemn the drums shrill, Death, august and royal, sing sorrow up into immortal spheres. There is music in the midst of desolation and a glory that shines upon our tears. They went with songs to the battle. They were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted. They fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. 
They mingle not with their laughing comrades again. They sit no more at familiar tables of home. They have no lot in our labour of the daytime. They sleep beyond England's foam. But where our desires are, and our hopes profound, felt as a wellspring that is hidden from sight, to the innermost heart of their own land they are known, as the stars are known to the night. As the stars that shall be bright when we are dust, moving in marches upon the heavenly plain, as the stars that are starry in the time of our darkness, to the end, to the end they remain. The Spirit by G. A. Studdard Kennedy. When I ain't no gal to kiss you, and the postman seems to miss you, and the fags have skipped an issue, carry on. When you've got an empty belly, and the bully's rotten smelly, and you're shivering like a jelly, carry on. When the Bosch has done your chumming, and the sergeant's done the rumming, and there ain't no rations coming, carry on. When the world is red and reeking, and the shrapnel shells are shrieking, and your blood is slowly leaking, carry on. When the broken, battered trenches are like the bloody butcher's benches, and the air is thick with stenches, carry on. Carry on, though your pals are pale and wan, and the hope of life is gone. Carry on, for to do more than you can is to be a British man, not a rotten also ran. Carry on. The Soldier by Rupert Brooke. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be, in that rich earth, a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers and blessed by sons of home. And think, Thin's heart, all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind, no less, gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and laughter, learnt of friends, and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. My boy Jack, Rudyard Kipling. Have you news of my boy Jack? Not this tide. When do you think that he'll come back? Not with this wind blowing and this tide. Has anyone else have had word of him? Not this tide. For what is sunk will hardly swim. Not with this wind blowing and with this tide. Oh dear, what comfort can I find? None this tide nor any tide, except he did not shame his kind, not even with that wind blowing and that tide. Then hold your head up all the more, this tide and every tide, because he was the son you bore and gave to that wind blowing and that tide. Thank you, Tony and Vern, and we'll be hearing more from the pair of them throughout the <coughs> afternoon. So next, would you give a very warm welcome to Alex Patterson, our Head of Collections here at Brooklyn's Museum. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a true honour to be here, stood in front of you this afternoon on this most significant um, and humbling days. Um, I've not been with the museum long, um, and this talk, um, gratefully, um, uh, very grateful for Steve and, and Tim to invite me to ask to talk to you today, um, has given me a real opportunity to, to dig in a, into an aspect of Brooklyn's um, history that I might not necessarily get to straight away. Mind saying, Brooklyn's played a really vital role in supporting Britain's war effort throughout the First World War. From the generosity and support of the Lock Kings to the innovations in flight and radio communi communications by industry leaders such as Marconi and Vickers, Brooklyn's became a significant hub of activity 
during this intense four-year period. However, its contribution would begin in the years leading up to 1914. While the emerging motor sports scene and early flight were developing at Brooklands, the War Office recognised that the next conflict would rely on new technologies such as motorbikes to improve rapid communications and overall efficiency. By 1912, manufacturers were invited by the War Office to submit their machines for supervised tests at Brooklands, helping to develop new forms of communication for the Army. The civilian flying schools of Brooklands also played a vital role to Britain's war effort in the lead-up to the war, unbeknown to them. The majority of pilots who learned to fly at Brooklands ended up by joining either the Royal Flying Corps or the Royal Naval Service, Air Service, both sort of emerging corps that uh, the Royal Air Force hadn't been formed until 1918. When war was declared on the 4th of August 1914, Hugh and Ethel Lock King offered Brooklands to the Army for the duration of the war, and the Royal Flying Corps officially took over the site the following day, a natural home for an emerging branch of the Army, focusing on the new technology of flight. It was a period let me see if we can get this there. There we are. It was a period of rapid change with the Italia Automobile Limited uh, factory going into voluntary re re receivership leaving their premises located next to the fork on the finishing straight empty. The image on the slide behind me illustrates how Brooklyn's developed by 1917 during the war. And what I'm going to try and do is give a brief highlight of how Brooklyn's con contributes to the war effort and hopefully put it into a bit of context. The Army's use of Brooklands led to all aspects of the site being used, including running lorries on the outer circuit of the track as a perimeter road. The solid tyres of these vehicles churned up the fragile concrete of the racing track and by May 1915 required extensive repairs. This, however, did not prevent some small levels of motorbike racing to be organised by the British Motorcycle Racing Club, albeit after the track was repaired. They sought to use the races as morale-boosting events at a time when the war was not going well. All entrants to the races were members of the armed for, uh, services, although the public were encouraged to come spectate. The first race became known as the All Khaki Meeting, held in August 1915. These races were also used as an opportunity for the Royal Flying Corps to evaluate both the motorcycles and their riders for future messenger use on the front line. In 1911, a Marconi Wireless Training School was established at Brooklands, as well as an experimental radio division. It was recognised relatively early on that the emerging new technology of flight would require pilots to be able to talk to those on the ground. While advances had been made, by 1914 successful transmission had not been achieved. The Royal Flying Corps took over the Marconi station in 1914, and by April 1915, the first ever successful ground-to-air voice transmission was carried out, quickly followed by the successful air-to-ground voice transmission in June of that year as well. As often, is in the case of, uh, as, as often in the case during times of war, technological advancements are made at a faster rate. At a time when radio communications were being advanced to support Britain's war effort in the air, they started to be applied in a range of uses. The establishment of the Observer Training School at Brooklands by 1915 was vital to help air reconnaissance training, learning to identify enemy gun posts, and would ultimately help British infantry in their attempts to advance the line and capture German territory. You can see in the background there the, the clubhouse and the size, so they were using all areas of sight. Pre-war, Vickers had a flying school at Brooklands, but little by the way of factory facilities. As aircraft became increasingly used in the war effort, there was even greater demand for manufacturers to provide enough planes for Royal Flying Corps and Royal Naval Air Service. Vickers' production site at Erith in Kent was not big enough for the needs and demands, and they'd been eyeing up Brooklands, and in particular, that abandoned Italia automobile factory alongside the finishing straight. The first aircraft to be built at Brooklands by Vickers was the Royal Aircraft Factory's BE-2C, as pictured here. The number of orders of new aircraft were considerable from 1915 onwards, 
The increasing demand by the War Office for more aircraft led to large numbers of people to be employed at the Vickers factory, boosting employment in the area. Vickers soon found they needed to expand their facilities further and added an extension along the track. By 1917, they needed even more space for their production lines, and Hugh Lock King sold Vickers Pinewood House and two other pieces of land located adjacent to Brooklands. By June, Vickers had received a new government order for the SE-5A, a replica of which can be seen in the aircraft factory. They were building, on average, 35 of these aircraft a day. Now, arguably one of the best-known fighters of the First World War, the Sopwith Camel, took its maiden flight here at Brooklands on the 22nd of December 1916. Now, while the aircraft was built at the Sopworth factory in Kingston, all the components were brought back here to Brooklands, where each aircraft was assembled and then flown. In all, 5,490 of these aircraft were produced, with 1,294 shot down by enemy aircraft. That's the most of any single type of British aircraft made during the First World War. Like the flying schools, Brooklands was home to a number of aircraft manufacturers that built up during the war. Mont, Side and Spad both needed to expand during this period and it ended up by moving some facilities off site. However, Brooklands remained a factory site for assembly, testing and getting aircraft to the front lines. With output increasing by the summer of 1917 at all of the factories at Brooklands, a large aircraft acceptance park was established for which new hangars were constructed. This aided the movement of aircraft from factory floor to the front. By the end of the war, Brooklands had become the most significant and single largest aircraft production centre in the country. In the four years of conflict, over 7,500 aircraft had been built here, of which there were 46 different types. Vickers proved to be the most productive manufacturer, as demonstrated with the production of the SE-5A, with over 2,165 built by Vickers, and Martinside only managing a mere 500 of the same aircraft. War had transformed the world of aviation and helped Brooklands become one of the primary centres of aircraft manufacturing in the country. By 1917, Vickers were designing a new type of aircraft that could carry a bomb into enemy territory and drop it from the air, the Vimy. While the Vimy did not see much action in the war, it eventually served a new purpose, achieving transatlantic flight. By 1919, the Daily Mail had re-established its great air race from North America to Britain, and a number of competitors from Brooklyn, including Martinside and Sopwith, entered the race. However, it was the Vickers Vimy that would ultimately succeed where others failed in June 1919. But what of the Lock Kings and Brooklyn's racetrack at the end of the war? Well, while there was much activity at Brooklyn supporting the war effort, Hugh and Ethel played their parts in other ways beyond making Brooklyn's available to the army. Ethel was highly active as the Vice President of the North Surrey and Kingston branch of the Red Cross. With the increasing number of casualties returning from the front line, she became responsible for 15 hospitals and recovery centres, a number of which were based in the properties owned by Hugh and Ethel. Her services were recognised in 1918 when she was appointed Dame of the Order of, British, of the British Empire. The racetrack was returned to the Lock Kings in 1919. However, the circuit required considerable repair due to the misuse during the war, and this would take some time. Brooklyn staged its first, ever ra back, uh, first race in uh, 1920, with Malcolm Campbell winning the, uh, winning the race in the Lorraine Dietrich, which is now resident in Jackson, said. And it started what would become the golden era of racing at Brooklyn's. The story of Brooklyn's during the war epitomizes what Brooklyn's represents through history. It was a place where people came together to push boundaries and to support one another. In the process of doing this, Brooklyn's became a place of many firsts, which helped Britain eventually secure a much hard fought for peace. Court revisited by A.P. Herbert. I wandered up to Beaucourt. I took the river track and saw the lines we lived in before the Bosch went back. 
But peace was now in puttage. The front was far ahead. The front had journeyed eastward and only left the dead. And I thought, how long we lay there and watched across the wire while guns roared round the valley and set the skies afire. But now there are homes in Hamel and tents in the Vale of Hell and a camp at Suicide Corner where half a regiment fell. The new troops follow after and tread the land we won. To them, tis so much hillside re-rested from the hum. We only walk with reverence this sullen mile of mud. The shell holes hold our history, and half of them are blood. Here, at the head of Pesh Street, t'was death to show your face. To me it seemed like magic to linger in the place. For me, how many spirits hung around the Kentish caves. But the new men see no spirits, they only see the graves. I found the half-dug ditches we fashioned for the fight. We lost a score of men there. Young James was killed that night. I saw the star shells staring. I heard the bullets hail. But the new troops passed unheeding. They never heard the tale. I crossed the blood-red ribbon that once was no man's land. I saw a misty daybreak and a creeping minute hand. And here the lads went over. And there was Harmsworth shot. And here was William lying. But the new men know them not. And I said, there is still the river and still the stiff, stark trees to treasure here our story, but there are only these. But under the whitewood crosses, the dead men answered low. The new men know not Beaucourt, but we are here. We know. Attack by Charles Walter Blackall. You're standing watch in hand, all waiting the command, while your guns have got their trenches fairly set. When they lengthen up the range, you feel a trifle strange as you clamber up the sandbag parapet. It's a case of do or die, still you rather wonder why your mate drops down beside you with a screech. But you're very soon aware when a bullet parts your hair that he's not the only pebble on the beach. It's each man for himself for your captain's on the shelf and you don't know if he's wounded or he's dead. So never count the cost of your comrades who are lost, but keep the line on forging straight ahead. The high explosive shell has blown their wire to hell and their trench is like a muddy, bloody drain. They're bolting left and right, and the few who stay to fight, well, not many see their fatherland again. But there's one cove that you've missed and he cops you in the wrist as you're stooping down to help a wounded chum. And though you're feeling mighty faint, as you're not a blooming saint, you blow his blasted brains to big kingdom come. You've done your little job and you drop down with a sob, for you're feeling half a man and half a wreck. And you say a little prayer, which for you is rather rare, for you got it in the arm and not the neck. When the evening shadows fall, you do your best to crawl till the stretcher bearers find you in a creek. Then you feel as right as rain and you forget the aching pain for you'll seal old England's shores within a week. August 1918 in a French village by Maurice Baring. I hear the tinkling of a cattle bell. In the broad stillness of the afternoon, high in the cloudless haze, the harvest moon is pallid as the phantom of a shell. A girl is drawing water from a well. I hear the clatter of her wooden shoon Two mothers to their sleeping babies croon, and the hot village feels the drowsy spell. Sleep, child, the angel of death, has, his wings has spread. His engines scour the land, the sea, the sky, and all the weapons of hell's armoury are ready for the blood that is their bread. And many a thousand men tonight must die, so many that they will not count the dead. From a base hospital in France by John Hay Maitland Hardiman. Christ, I'm blind. God, give me strength to bear that which I have most dreaded all my days. The palsied, shuffling, grasping air. The moving prison, five foot square. The haunting step that isn't there. These pictures dance before my sightless gaze. Next, I'd like to welcome our former 
Chairman of the Brooklands Museum Trust, Lord Trithgarn. My father, the late Lord Trefgarn, was born in 1894 in South Wales, the son of a minister in the Congregational Church, the Reverend David Carrow Jones. He joined the Denbyshire Yeomanry in 1912 and was commissioned into the South Wales Borderers in 1914 and sent to France when the war broke out. He served for over a year in the trenches in France and in January 1916, he applied to join the Royal Flying Corps. Initially, he heard nothing. Then on the morning of the 3rd of July 1916, he was ordered to take his machine gun section forward that night to a place called Mermet's Wood. However, later that same day, he received orders to the effect that his application to join the Royal Flying Corps had been accepted and he was to return to the UK that night to be trained as an observer. He immediately asked permission to delay his return for 24 hours in order to take his machine gun section forward as he had already been ordered. Permission to delay his return to the UK was refused despite his repeated requests. The section was taken forward that evening by another officer and did not return. My father never got over these events. He felt he had let his men down when they needed him most. But he completed his observer training in the UK and returned to France later in 1916. On his first flight as an observer, he was ordered on a bombing raid with a pilot called Quentin Brand, who became a lifelong friend and rose to the rank of Air Vice Marshal. Incidentally, Squadron Leader Brand, as he then was, was, I believe, the first man to fly solo to the South Africa, departing from Brooklands in 1924. My father, Captain Garrow Jones, as he was by then, was promoted to pilot in 1917, and after a further short period in France, was sent to the United States as an instructor to the fledgling United States Air Force. Following the 1914-18 war, he became a member of Parliament, and in 1941 was appointed a junior minister in Churchill's coalition government. In that role, another Brooklands connection emerged. Late in 1942, Barnes Wallace was actively promoting his dam buster project. He wrote to many people, including Winston Churchill, the prime minister. Winston summoned the then parliamentary secretary at the Ministry of Production and instructed him to look into Wallace's proposals and report. After what is now a famous meeting at the RAF Club, my father was convinced and reported accordingly to the Prime Minister the following morning. The rest, as they say, is history. My father sadly died in 1960. Had he lived longer, I'm certain he would have wanted to play a part here at Brooklands. No Man's Land by R. H. Beck. 9.30 o'clock, then over the top. And mind to keep down when you see the flare of very pistols surging the air. Now, over you get. Look out for the wire and the borrow pit and the empty tins. They are meant for the hand to bark his shins. So keep well down and reserve your fire. All over? Right, there's a gap just here in the corkscrew wire, so just follow me. If you keep well down, there's nothing to fear. Then we creep through the gap gathering gloom of no man's land while the big guns boom right over our heads. And the rapid crack of the Lewis guns is answered back by the German barking of the same refrain of crack, crack, crack all over again. To the wistful eye of the parapet in the smiling sun of a summer's day, it were a sin to believe that a bloody death in those waving grasses lurk lay. But now, beneath the very fitful flares, Keep still, my lads. Freeze like hares. All right, carry on. For we're, out, we're out to inquire if our friend, the Hun, has got a gap in his wire. And he hasn't invited us out, you see. 
So lift up your feet and follow me. Then, silent, we press with a noiseless tread through no man's land. But the sightless dead, I muffle your footsteps well you may, for the mouldering corpses here decay, whom no man owns but the king abhorred. Grim Pluto, Stygia's overlord, O oh, breathe a pair, prayer for the sightless dead, who have bitten the dust neath the biting lead, of the pitiless hail of the maxim's fire neath the wash of shell in the well-trod mire. Ah oh, well, but we've too got a job to be done, for we've come to the wire of our friend, the Hun. Now keep well down, lads. Can you see any gap? Not much. Well, the reference is wrong in the map. So homeward we go through the friendly night that covers the no-man land from sight. As muttering a noiseless prayer of praise, we drop from the parapet into the bays. <coughs> to His Love by Ivor Gurney He's gone, and all our plans are useless indeed. We'll walk no more on Cotswolds, where the sheep feed quietly and take no heed. His body that was so quick is not as you knew it. On Severn River, under the blue, driving our small boat through. You would not know him now, but still he died nobly, so cover him over with violets of pride, purple from Severn's side. Cover him, cover him soon, and with thick set masses of memoried flowers, Hide that red wet thing I must somehow forget. The deserter, Gilbert Franco. I'm sorry I done it, Major. We bandaged the livid face and led him out ere the one sun rose to die his death of ignorance. The bolt heads locked to the cartridges, the rifles stead to the rest, as cold stock nestled at colder cheek and foresight lined on the breast. Fire, called the Sergeant Major. The muzzles flamed as he spoke, and the shameless soul of a nameless man went up in cordite smoke. Reverie by William Hodgson. At home they see on Skiddaw his royal purple lie, an autumn up in Newlands arrayed in russet dye, or under burning woodland the still lake's grummery, and far off and grim and sable, the menace of the gable lifts up his stark aloofness against the western sky. At best, best for time, in Durham, the level evening falls upon the shadowy river that slides by ancient walls, where out of cranny turrets the mellow belfry calls. And there sleep brings forgetting, and morning no regretting, and love is laughter wedded to health in happy halls. But here are blood and blisters, and thirst as hard as sand, an interminable travelling, interminable land, and stench and filth and sickness and hate by hardship fanned, the haunt of desolation, wherein a desperate nation writhes in the grip of murder's inexorable hand. Above the graves of heroes the wooden crosses grow, that shall no more see Durham, nor any place they know, where fell tops face the morning, and great winds blow, who loving as none other, the land that is their mother, unfaltering, renounced her, because they loved her so. Epitaphs, a son, Rudyard Kipling. My son was killed while laughing at some jest. I would I knew what it was, and it might serve me in a time when <coughs> jests a few. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'd like to introduce Tim Morris, who's going to talk about his grandfather, Tom Thornton. Welcome, Tim. Okay, my, my granddad I'm going to talk about today, um, he was born in 1897 down in Hampshire to a family of estate workers. And hopefully if these pictures will work, there they are. And um, that's at Marwell Hall. 
So I don't know if anyone knows Marwell these days. It's a zoo. It wasn't back then, of course. Um, this picture was taken around 1914, 1915. Uh, my granddad up there. Um, he did have an elder brother who was already in the First World War at that time. He was a lieutenant in the <coughs> Hampshire Regiment. Um, so it's quite natural that Tom would also go into the Hampshires. And he did a test in February 1916. He was at the age of 18, slightly underage, but not too much. Um, he took a medical, I'll say that, took a medical um, as part of his training, and they found that he had what he always called a dicky heart. That meant that he was not fit enough to fight on the front, but he still wanted to play his part. Um, that also meant that he couldn't be in the Hampshire Regiment. Now, come uh, 1916, uh, it was realised that uh, the infantry couldn't do their own work. And as you can imagine, on a battlefield, there's a lot of infrastructure that goes behind it. So uh, infantry works companies had started to become uh, the norm. And he was transferred into the 7th Infantry Labour Company of the Devonshire Regiment. No association with Devonshire at all. Um, but this was not uncommon at the time. Um, he did move on, as we can see there in the slide, later, but I'll come across that uh, in a little bit while. Um, Labour Corps, works companies, whatever you might want to call them, there are a few of these things around. The Army Service Corps were formed. They were principally unloading ships and operating docks. There were two railway labour companies building railways and operating them. Um, the Royal Engineers were there. They had raised 11 battalions of labouring men. Um, the infantry, pioneer and works battalions also formed. They were consisting mainly of men with particular skills, uh, such as smiths, carpenters, bricklayers and so on. Um, but also unskilled men who were good with picks and shovels. My granddad, being an estate worker, that's what he was used to doing quite a lot. Um, he was classified as a B1. They had to be an A-class medical person to be able to fight on the front. But a B1 did mean that he could shoot wearing glasses, he could march five miles, and he could also hear well. So he wasn't too bad, really. Um, in February of 1917, there were so many of these works companies around that they decided to consolidate all those units into something called the Labour Corps. Um, a big umbrella organisation, basically, as a temporary measure. So this was Tom's 3rd Regiment, uh, the 7th Infantry Labour Company Devonshire Regiment, into the 172 Company Labour Corps. 203 companies were formed, and they, they covered a wide range of areas. Uh, by the end of the war, that's their cap badge, uh, there were 400,000 men in the Labour Corps engaged in this work. It's 11% of the British forces, so quite a lot. And another 300,000 uh, foreign labourers uh, were in there as well. Now, Tom himself was sent to France. Oh, no, before we get to that point, we've got what do the Labour Corps actually do? And the whole list of things miraculously appearing behind me. <coughs> Basically, they, they did virtually everything that wasn't fighting on the front. Um, some were not armed. You <coughs> see quite a few. So it's anything really from operating theatres and cinemas, entertainment on camps, to body retrieval and burial of the dead. So a very wide range of uh, things that they actually did. Um, Tom, going back to him, he was sent to France with his regiment. He was based at Doulon, um, from where he would service the Western Front. Um, he was mainly, uh, actually that picture is collecting tins, cans for scrap, another job the Labour Corps did. Building roads, yet another job. Collecting scrap again, weapons, helmets from the front line. So these guys were not actually behind the lines all the time, they were on the front, they were collecting this stuff. Um, a bit like borrowers, they were foraging everything and bringing it back. 
Um, Tom was mainly involved in building railway lines and we can see some of the labour called there, building a, a full gauge railway in fact there. There were 2,340 miles of broad gauge railway built to service the Western Front and 1,348 miles of narrow gauge. Uh, based at Dillon, he was mainly uh, working around the Albert and Arras areas through 1916 and into 1917, but he also worked further north into the, the Popperinge area. I think we can see some, yeah, some Labour Corps there, actually on the miniature railways and laying lines. It was a thankless <coughs> task because these lines were the ones that were going right up to the front, serving ammunition, carrying troops, bringing back the wounded and bringing back the dead as well. Um, however, they were in the firing line, so they were being shelled constantly. And um, he, Tom uh, certainly uh, remembered a few uh, rather gory stories, which I won't repeat all of them here, but one that isn't. Um, there was an ammunition dump that he was working at up near Popperinge, and uh, a shell came right in the middle of it, causing a massive explosion. They were told to run as fast as they could and get out, so he did. But it was so disorientating in the scenery there the, that he couldn't find his way back to his regiment again for three days. So he was lost. Um, again, that was not too uncommon. People did get lost from their regiments. Um, however, oh, there's another one. They're bringing some wounded soldiers back. A little word about other people that helped out there. That's the Chinese Labour Corps. Now, you may have heard of those. They've had a bit of publicity. There are Chinese uh, Labour Corps cemeteries on the Western Front in northern France. Um, there were quite a lot that were brought over to do this work. There are also other nationalities, Commonwealth nationalities, that helped out as well. However, on the formation of the Labour Corps, Tom was sent to Italy, where he was based at Camp 3 at Faenza. Now, this is about the only... Well, I found two pictures of Faenza. This was one. Uh, these are some of the officers with a local lady at the camp. And that is the other. That's the Indian camp that was at Faenza. It was a huge camp. Um, they were servicing transport across the continent from there. Uh, so trains were being used to move British, Indian troops, Chinese Labour Corps, uh, right across the globe, really. Um, so there were four camps, big camps, one at Cherbourg, one at uh, Lyon, one at Faenza, where my granddad was, and Camp 4 at Brindisi and Taranto in southern Italy. So these were big service camps. They got so big... Um, that they had to have satellite camps around them as well. And Tom ended up at one of those, Castellamare. Doesn't look too bad on, on the uh, Italian coast there. Yeah, but um, so there were quite a lot of these little satellite camps around, but they were all based essentially in Faenza. Their jobs there, ablutions, latrines, feeding, maintenance of the camps, entertainment and, and that type of thing really. There we are, yep. That's Tom in an aeroplane. He never flew. You can tell probably that's a stage photograph. Uh, <laughs> did you believe that? Yeah, Castellamare. Um, one of the entertainment things, I guess, I never really did understand what, what this picture was about, uh, and he never said, but I guess it's one of the entertainments, photographs in a studio to send home to their loved ones, um, wherever they may be. Um, Tom remained in Italy for over two years. Uh, in that time, he didn't have any leave at all um, until October of 1918. And he came home for a week all the way from Italy by train, took ages, uh, then all the way back again, so that he got back uh, in November and there was a big celebration when he got back in Italy. And it was November the 11th. So he, thought, he always thought that if he'd lasted another week or so, he wouldn't have had to go back again. <laughs> I think he probably would have done, but uh, yeah, that was a, what he always thought. It's a shame. He stayed there for another year. Uh, he wasn't demobbed until October 1919, and he returned to England again. Um, the Labour Corps itself 
was disbanded in 1920. No need for it after the war. These labour courts were only really in wartime, pioneer courts and so on, they were in wartime. Uh, it does still exist in a form. It was reformed in 1939 as the Pioneer Corps. Uh, that was later merged into the Royal Logistics Corps in 1993, which still exists today. Upon uh, his return, uh, he went back to Marwell Hall again, where he met his wife. They moved to Surrey in 1938, with their th three children living over in Thorpe. Um, so we're getting a bit closer to home now. Uh, he worked on another estate in Virginia Water. Uh, their daughter, my mum, married uh, Ron Morris, who became a volunteer at Brooklands. There's a connection. And um, of course I'm here as well, and I'm their son. So another connection. So we have connections to Brooklands. Um, Tom did serve, as this picture shows, in the Home Guard. This is the Yegham and Chertsey Home Guard, 10th Battalion. There's Tom in the front, uh, Lance Corporal down at the front there. So he was in his 40s by this time, so too old again to fight in the Second World War, but wanted to do his bit, which meant um, meeting at the Rose and Crown on Thorpe Green. <laughs> From what I can gather most of the time. There we are. So that's quite good. And as for his dicky heart, okay, so he lasted through the Second World War. He actually lasted until 1991, at the age of 94. <laughs> so it couldn't have been that dicky, really, could it? <coughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> On the Wings of the Morning by Geoffrey Day. A sudden roar, a mighty rushing sound, a jolt or two, a smoothly sliding rise, a tumbled blur of disappearing ground, and then all sense of motion slowly dies. Quiet and calm, the earth slips past below, as underneath the bridge still waters flow. My turning wing inclines towards the ground. The ground itself glides up with graceful swing, and at lane's far tip twirls slowly round, then drops from sight again beneath the wing, to slip away serenely as before a cubist patterned carpet on the floor. Hills gently sink and valleys gently fill. The flattened fields grow ludicrously small. Slowly they pass beneath and slower still until they hardly seem to move at all. Then suddenly they disappear from sight, hidden by fleeting wisps of faded white. The wingtips, faint and dripping, dimly show, blurred by the wreaths of mist that intervene. Weird, half-seen shadows flicker to and fro across the pallid fog bank's blinding screen. At last the choking mists release their hold and all the world is silver, blue and gold. The air is clear, more clear than sparkling wine compared with this wine as a turgid brew. The far horizon makes a clean-cut line between the silver and depthless blue. Out of the snow-white level reared on high, glittering hills surge up to meet the sky. Outside the windscreen shelter, gales may race, but in the seat, a cool and gentle breeze blows steadily upon my grateful face, as I sit motionless and at my ease, contented just to loiter in the sun and gaze around me till the day is done. And so I sit half sleeping, half awake, dreaming a happy dream of golden days, until at last, with a reluctant shake, I rouse myself and with lingering gaze at all the splendor of the shining plain, make ready to come down to earth again. The engine stops. A pleasant silence reigns. Silence not broken, but intensified by the soft, sleepy, wire-insistent strains that rise and fall as with a sweeping glide I slither down the well-oiled sides of space towards a lower, less enchanted place. The clouds draw nearer, changing as they come. Now like a flash, fog grips me by the throat. Down goes the nose. At once the wire's low hum begins to rise in volume and in note, till as I hurtle from the choking cloud, it swells into a scream, high-pitched and loud. The scattered hues and shades of green and brown fashion themselves into the land I know, turning and twisting as I spiral down towards the landing ground, till, skimming low, I glide with slackening speed across the ground 
and come to rest with lightly grating sound. A Dead Bosch by Robert Graves. To you who'd read my songs of war and only hear of blood and fame, I'll say you've heard it said before, war's hell. And if you doubt the same, today I found in Mamet's wood a certain cure for lust of blood, where propped against a shattered trunk in a great mess of things unclean sat a dead Bosch. He scowled and stunk, with clothes and face a sodden green, big-bellied, spectacled, crop-haired, dribbling black blood from his nose and beard. <coughs> the Deserter by Winifred M. Letts. There was a man, don't mind his name, whom fear had dogged by night and day. He could not face the German guns, and so he turned and ran away. Just that. He turned and ran away. But who can judge him? You or I? God makes a man of flesh and blood who yearns to live and not to die. And this man, when he feared to die, was scared as any frightened child. His knees were shaking under him. His breath came fast. His eyes were wild. I've seen a hare with eyes as wild with throbbing heart and sobbing breath. But, oh, it's, it shames one soul to see a man in abject fear of death. But fear had gripped him. So had death. His number had gone up that day. They might not heed his frightened eyes. They shot him when the dawn was grey, blindfolded when the dawn was grey. He stood there in a place apart. The shots rang out and down he fell an English bullet in his heart. An English bullet in his heart. But here's the irony of life. His mother thinks he fought and fell a hero, foremost in the strife. So she goes proudly to the strife her best, her hero son she gave. Oh, well for her, she does not know. He lies in a deserter's grave. Please welcome a BTM member and a great friend, Mike Dawes. Good afternoon, friends. My name is Mike, and I'd like to introduce you to one of between three and four million anonymous unseen casualties of the war. My great aunt, born Annie Gillett, and known as Nan. She was born in 1888 in Worcestershire, the youngest of three, Ernest, Ellen, my grandmother, and her. By April 1911, she was in domestic service in Paddington, and later that year married Arthur Lee Granger. They set up their home at 125 Mallinson Road, Clapham Junction. There we see the property. It's still there today. I passed it by quite recently. Following the outbreak of war, Arthur signed up with the 16th Service Battalion Royal Welsh Fusiliers, which became part of the 38th Welsh. The Third Battle of Ypres, otherwise known as Passchendaele, officially began on 31st of July 1917, but the Welsh were in the thick of it even before the start. They had returned to the line on 19th 20th July to be subjected to not only heavy shell fire, but it's also attacks by the new and deadly mustard gas. Then on the night of the 30th, the division went to their assembly positions with the objective of taking the village of Pilkham the next day. Despite successfully completing their mission, their casualties were heavy. Up on Pilkham Ridge, which is about six kilometers due north of Ypres, there's a Welsh memorial that was built last year, and it's in that area that Arthur was mortally wounded. The dragon that you see behind you is, is part of that wonderful uh, memorial that's, that now exists to all Welshmen who served in the Western Front. 
So he was mortally wounded and brought back behind the lines to the casualty clearing station at Dozingham, where he died on 2nd August. His grave is one of over 3,000 in Dozingham Military Cemetery. The inscription that Nan specified for his headstone was ever loved and missed by his devoted wife Nan, faithful unto death. I mentioned that Nan had an older brother. Ernest stayed in Warwickshire and became a rural postman living with his wife Ada at 40 Shottery Road, Stratford-on-Avon. For him it would have been a natural choice to have signed up with the 2nd 8th Battalion London Regiment, the Post Office Rifles. Throughout the war, their battle honours were legendary and earned them the title of Terriers of the Trenches. They too were to join in the Hell of Passchendaele. At the capture of Verst Farm in September 1917, the Rifles lost over half its fighting strength, dead or wounded. Then, on 28th October, a sudden order was given to the battalion to attack on the night of 29-30th. It was to support the main attack by Canadian forces on Passchendaele Ridge. The state of the ground was awful. There had been days of rain and the duck boards were several hundred yards short of the outpost line. Aerial photos showed the ground to be like a vast morass of mud and slime. In places, little progress could be made. Men sunk up to their armpits and provided easy target to the enemy. Remarkably, a 500-yard advance was made in places. And whilst most of this had to be evacuated by night on the 30th, it did mark the end of the beginning of the battle. Beginning of the end of the battle. Within a week, Passchendaele was in Canadian hands. That night, their ca casualties were severe. The post office rifles lost 39 known to be killed and 173 missing, many of whom drowned in the mud. Rifleman Ernest Gillett was never found. His is one of nearly 35,000 names recorded on the walls of the Tynecott Memorial for those who have no known grave. As for Nan, she just soldiered, up, soldiered on, as her generation was expected to do. She visited Dozingham from time to time up to 1939, and in fact went there just a couple of weeks before the Germans got there uh, with my mother. I'm pleased to say they both came back, otherwise my mother would either be speaking German or not here, <laughs> to, to have given birth to me later. She carried on living at Mallinson Road until she had to go into a care home shortly before she died in August 1967. On her death certificate, her occupation is described as widow of Arthur Lee Granger, a butcher. That pretty much sums it up. Arthur and Ernest have their memorials in both Flanders and England, but there is no memorial for Nan. She and her sister-in-law, Ada, were but two of a quarter of a million British women widowed because of the First World War. They had to wear mourning attire and respect a several month period of widowhood, but their husbands, if they could be found, were usually buried where they died. Those who didn't follow the rules ran the risk of being seen as unfaithful widows. Now the concept of unfaithful widows had existed before the war but it regained popularity during the conflict due in large part to soldiers who feared being betrayed or forgotten. And by moralists who saw widowed women as a possible source of social disorder that could potentially contribute to their country's defeat. At the outbreak of war, the government introduced a national war widows pension scheme. From 1916, it was administered by the Ministry of Pensions and the hated Special Grants Committee became the body that assessed war widows' eligibility. This commission's decision-making was flawed and widely criticised. 
It determined whether we, women were worthy of state support by assessing, sometimes by covert means, their moral and sexual behaviour, parental practices and housekeeping. Pensions were partially or totally lost by widows in the case of remarriage or cohabitation. Thus, losing one's husband wasn't enough to ensure that a widow received a pension from the state. She had to be seen to be continually deserving the pension. Yet it was always insufficient to cover the daily needs of the widows, and many of whom topped up their incomes by working, relying on hope, help from their families or new spouses, or charitable associations. War widows were restricted by considerable social and political constraints. Speeches and pictures from the time <coughs> illustrate the ambiguous position of the war widow who was expected to remain faithful to her fallen husband whilst also contributing to the renewal of future generations for the nation. The final insult for Nan was Neville Chamberlain's Pensions Act of 1925, which stopped her war widow's pension completely. But then that simply put her in the same financial position as an unknown number of other ladies who had lost a fiancé and for whom life would never be the same again. Together with those who had never formed a relationship, they became members of what became known as the Million Surplus Women. Thank you. Dead and Buried by G. A. Studdard Kennedy. I have borne my cross through Flanders, through the broken heart of France. I have borne it through the deserts of the East. I have wandered faint and longing through the human hosts that thronging swarm to glut their grinning idols with a feast. I was crucified in Cambrai and again outside Bapom. I was scourged for miles along the Albert Road. I was driven, pierced and bleeding, with a million maggots feeding on the body that I carried as my load. I have craved a cup of water, just a drop, to quench my thirst, as the routed armies ran to keep the pace. But no soldier made reply as the maddened hosts swept by, and a sweating straggler kicked me in the face. There's no ecstasy of torture that the devil's air devised, that my soul has not endured to the last as I bore my cross of sorrow for the glory of tomorrow through the wilderness of battles that is past. Yet my heart was still unbroken and my hope was still unquenched till I bore my cross to Paris through the crowd. Soldiers pierced me on the Aisne, but twas by the river Seine that the statesmen broke my legs and made my shroud. There they wrapped my mangled body in fine linen of fair words with the perfume of a sweetly scented lie, and they laid it in the tomb of the golden mirrored room mid the many fountain gardens of Versailles. With a thousand scraps of paper they made fast the open door, and the wise men of the council saw it sealed. With the seal of subtle lying they made certain of my dying, lest the torment of the peoples should be healed. Then they set a guard of soldiers night and day beside the tomb where the body of the Prince of Peace is laid and the captains of the nations keep the sentries to their stations lest the statesman's trust from Satan be destroyed. For it isn't steel and iron that men use to kill their God but the poison of a smooth and slimy tongue. Steel and iron tear the body but it's oily, sham and shoddy that have trampled down God's spirit in the dung. <clears throat> war by Leslie Coulson. Where war has left its wake of whitened bone, soft stems of summer grass shall wave again, and all the blood that war has ever strewn is but a passing stain. The Sniper by G.A. Studdard Kennedy. 
There's a jerry over there, Sarge. Can't you see his big square head? If he bobs it up then again there, I'll soon nail him, I'll nail him dead. Give me up that pair of glasses and just fix that blinking sight. Go. Oh, that nearly almost got him. There he is now, see? Half right. If he moves again, I'll get him. Take these glasses here and see. What's that? Got him through the head, Sarge. No, where's my blasted cup of tea? <laughs> For All We Have and Are by Rudyard Kipling For all we have and are, for all our children's fate Stand up and take the war, the Hun is at the gate Our world has passed away in wantonness overthrown There is nothing left today but steel and fire and stone Though all we knew depart, the old commandments stand In courage, catch your heart, in strength, lift up your hand Once more we hear the word that sickened earth of old no law except the sword, unsheathed and uncontrolled. Once more it knits mankind, once <coughs> more the nations go to meet and break and bind a crazed and driven foe. Comfort, content, delight, the age's slow-bought gain. They shriveled in a night, only ourselves remain. To face the naked days in silent fortitude, through perils and dismays, renewed and renewed. Though all we may depart, the old commandments stand. In patience, keep your heart. In strength, lift up your hand. No easy hope or lies shall bring us to our goal. But iron sacrifice of body, will and soul. There is but one task for all, one life for each to give. What stands if freedom fall? Who dies if England live? War by G. A. Studdard Kennedy. Waste of muscle, waste of brain, waste of patience, waste of pain, waste of manhood, waste of health, waste of beauty, waste of wealth, waste of blood and waste of tears, waste of youth's most precious years, waste of ways the saints have trod, waste of glory, waste of God. War. Epitaphs, Common Form, by Rudyard Kipling. If any question why we died, tell them, because our fathers lied. The Machine Gun, by John Hobson. Here do I lie, crouched in the grass with my machine gun, loaded, lurking, ready. Fast must he fly who fain would pass. Sure is my eye, my hand is steady. The sky is blue, the planes are humming, but my machine gun waits and watches ever. Fair is the view, though guns be drumming through yonder hill from this king death doth sever. Around me blows the dog rose, but my machine gun, hidden in daisies, Lurking is he where the grass grows, peering ever forth through summer hazes. Come ye who may foemen in air or earth, for my machine gun sings for you alone. And in his late a silvery death gives birth, now lifts, now lowers he his deadly tone. Speak him not fair, he peers but does not see my black machine gun, who waits from night to morn. Silent is his low lair, Mighty, unseen, and free, dealer of death and wounds to those who scorn. Here do I lie, hidden by grass and flowers, with my machine gun, ghost of modern war. The sun floats high, the moon through deep blue hours. I watch with my machine gun at death's grim door. Hello everyone. Um, <laughs> I'd like to introduce you 
to Charles Alfred Hunt, who is my great-great-uncle on my mother's side. He was born in March 1888 in Mile End in East London. And now I'm an amateur family historian, and for many years, that's all I knew about Charles. He was on the census record, but he disappeared off the census record in um, 1911. And like many strands of your family tree, you just think, well, I'll, I'll pick him up another time. I was really fortunate that a few years ago, um, I was given a carrier bag, which was destined for the tip, which was actually full of uh, family history memorabilia, um, artifacts, photographs. And this was one of the photographs in that bag that was destined for the tip. And thankfully, Charles had the forethought to sign it at the bottom, so I knew who he was. Um, so from that um, photograph, we were then able to establish that he had been a soldier um, in the First World War, and I'd been really keen to find out about my family's First World War history for ever such a long time. So I started doing some research on him and found out that he had been a 12th Lancer. Um, I'm very evangelical about people researching their family history, so much so that I went to work at the National Archives, um, where I conducted a lot of my research, and one of the items I found was um, his medal index card from the First World War. I've got a copy of it at the back, um, and it showed that he actually died of his wounds um, on the 29th of August 1914, so he'd barely been out there any time at all. Now, as part of my job at the National Archives, I wrote some blogs called My Tommy's War, and it was uh, people at the National Archives showing their research into their family and how that could help other people. So I wrote a blog about Charles, um, put all the details in there that I had, including when he died, um, where he'd been born, um, and, and just put it out into the world. And what the world did is come back in spades to give me loads of information about him. Now, I think I was fortunate because he died at the beginning of the war, not fortunate for him, but fortunate for me that he died at the beginning of the war so there was a lot of stuff recorded about him. Um, and one of the first things that happened was uh, the 12th Lancers, 12th Lancers Regimental Historian got in contact with me and gave me loads of information. <coughs> this was the last photograph ever taken of Charles, and this was when they were heading over to France. Um, he went over to Southampton, uh, from Southampton to France. And what the Regimental Historian also did was gave me lots of information from personal diaries. Um, he was known as Mick. Nobody knows why, because they, they assumed that he might have an Irish connection. He doesn't. But his nickname to his pals was Mick. Um, what the regimental historians were able to tell me um, was that, as I say, he was well-liked. He had lots of pals. And in these personal diaries, um, it describes um, the chaps all going over <coughs> on the boat, having coffee when they arrived in France, um, how he, he had four particular friends, and they shared a tent together. Um, they cut each other's hair with um, horse clippers, which was another interesting fact. Um, but also what the regimental historian was able to do was um, give me more information about Charles's death. He was actually um, mortally wounded in an action on the 25th of August. So he, he'd barely been there. Bearing in mind he was a regular soldier. He'd been a soldier, well, he'd been a Lancer since 1907. He'd been to India, he'd been to South Africa. He'd never seen service. And within two weeks, he's sent to an orchard with a group of other men to round up what they thought was a small group of Germans, but it turned out to be a much larger force. Um, and most of the men that were sent into that orchard never came out. Um, what I was also able to do was access the archives of the village in which he's buried. Um, and they were able to uh, fill in some details um, about the, the action in the uh, orchard, how the men were overrun, how they were taken, um, the injured men were taken by the villagers because it was the very start of the war, so there, was no, there were no real um, ho army hospitals to speak of. And he and his uh, a f a fellow uh, Lancer um, were looked after in the local Red Cross hospital by an ab abbess. Um, unfortunately, Charles had been shot in the stomach and his pal um, W.W. Topman had been shot in the leg. Um, Charles survived four days after being shot in the stomach, and um, the local archive was also able to tell me uh, the names of the people who buried him. So I'm, I've been fortunate that I've got this whole picture of Charles. Um, this is his grave, and what you'll see, this is when I visited um, on the 100th anniversary of his death. I left the uh, wreath of poppies 
but um, what you'll see in the next picture is the local school children at the beginning of um, uh, the, the centenary had gone to, to lay flowers <coughs> because this, is, this isn't a um, uh, Commonwealth War grave site, this is a village graveyard because they died so early on in the conflict. Um, and there's, I think there's three from the beginning of the war and then three from where uh, the, this village was actually um, taken back from the Germans because they, they, they took this, this land and it was behind enemy lines for most of the war. Um, but the, this village considers these to be their heroes. So every year they'll go down and um, lay flowers for them, which I think is lovely. Now, one of the other things, this is why I'm evangelical about people getting in touch with their local family history societies, um, putting their ancestors out there to see what comes back. Because through my blog, uh, the East London Family History Society got in touch with me. They published an article about Charles, and I started to get all sorts of things about him. Now, this was Charles with his best pal, um, Charles Strapling. Um, and it turns out that um, I've now made contact with Charles Strabling's um, granddaughter. And that's through putting the information out there, through putting the blog out there. Bearing in mind, I knew nothing about Charles to start off with in the process, and now I know who his best friend is, which is totally amazing. Don't know who the women are. <laughs> They're very pretty. But, um, and this is, um, this is Charles. Next to him is Charles Strabling. And next to him is George Strabling, Charles' brother, who <coughs> he's got a glass eye, so he didn't fight in the war. But um, Charles Strabling also fought in the war, and he died on the Somme. Um, so yeah, all the friends died. But that's basically what I wanted to tell you about the experience. Sorry, I realise I haven't been speaking into the microphone because <laughs> sorry everybody. Um, but yeah, the, m my main thing is, is is research your family history, research your um, World War One um, service member, whether it be a man or a woman, and put that information out there and see what comes back because I got back so much information about Charles and I know so much about him now. Who Made the Law by Leslie Coulson Who made the law that men should die in meadows? Who spake the word that blood should splash in lanes? Who gave it forth that gardens should be boneyards? Who spread the hills with flesh and blood and brains? Who made the law? Who made the law that death should stalk the village? Who spake the word to kill among the sheaves? Who gave it forth that death should lurk in hedgerows? Who flung the dead amongst the fallen leaves? Who made the law? Those who return shall find that peace endures. Find old things old and know the things they knew. Walk in the garden, slumber by the fireside, share the peace of dawn, and dream amid the dew, those who return. Those who return shall till the, shall till the ancient pastures. Clean-hearted men shall guide the plough-horse reins. Some shall grow apples and flowers in the valleys. Some shall go courting in summer down the lanes, those who return. But who made the law? The trees shall whisper to him. Walking the meadows, he shall hear the bones crackle, and fleshless mouths shall gibber in silent lanes at dark. Who made the law? Who made the law? At noon upon the hillside, his ears shall hear a moan, his cheeks shall feel a breath, and all along the valleys, past gardens, croft, and homesteads, he who made the law, he who made the law, he who made the law shall walk along with death. Who made the law? Ladies and gentlemen, um, this is High Wood, uh, called by the French um, Bois de Fanot, uh, the famous spot which in 1916, July, August and September, uh, was the scene of long and bitterly contested strife by reason of its high commanding site. Um, observe the effect of shell fire in the trees, uh, standing and falling, and um, here is wire. Uh, this trench for months inhabited, 12 times changed hands. Uh, they soon fall in, <laughs> used later as a grave. It has been said on good authority that in the fighting for this patch of wood were killed somewhere above 8,000 men. 
and then the greater part uh, were buried here. Uh, this mound on which you stand be... Oh! Madam, please! You are requested kindly not to touch or take away the company's property as souvenirs. You'll find we have on sale a large variety, all guaranteed. <clears throat> as I was saying, um, all is as it was. Um, this is an unknown British officer, uh, the tunic having lately rotted off. Uh, please follow me uh, this way. The path, sir, please. The ground which was secured at great expense, uh, the company keeps absolutely untouched. And in that dugout, genuine, we provide refreshments at a reasonable rate. You are requested not to leave about paper or ginger beer bottles or orange peel. Uh, there are waste paper baskets at the gate. by Philip Johnston. <laughs> Hello. Can we do this once again? Oh, do this once again. Yeah. Got carried away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, reading now from The Last Post by Alwyn W. Turner. When Big Ben struck 11 o'clock on the morning of the 11th of November, 1919, no one really knew what was going to happen next. It was exactly one year since buglers had sounded the ceasefire on the Western Front, bringing the Great War to a close. And just a few days ago, King George V had issued a call that the occasion should be marked by a moment without precedent or parallel in British history. I believe, his message proclaimed, that my people in every part of the empire fervently wish to perpetuate the memory of that great deliverance and of those who laid down their lives to achieve it. And so he proposed that at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, there may be, for the brief space of two minutes, a complete suspension of all our normal activities. It was a bold idea, and even the king was nervous about its implementation. How would it work in practice? How would this simple service of silence and remembrance manifest itself? Above all, how would it feel? This was something entirely new. This was not a spectacle, a ceremony for the great and the good, it was to be a democratic expression of loss and suffering in which the entire nation would participate as equals. But still, no one knew what it would be like. The very nature of the event meant that there could be hardly any formal organisation. Instructions had been given that all public transport in London should come to a halt, with tube trains remaining in stations so they did not have to sit in tunnels, whilst the Metropolitan Police had been ordered to stop traffic in the capital. Beyond those basic arrangements, however, the government could do little but entrust the implementation of the concept to civic sentiment. Consequently, there was a sense of trepidation. Some worried that the <coughs> event might degenerate into a sort of cheap theatricalism on the one hand, or into a confused and incoherent observance on the other. Worst of all, there was the fear that it might not catch the public imagination, that the mood of the nation might have been misjudged. Even before the chiming of the hour, however, the concerns had been forgotten. Long before 11 o'clock, the throngs who gathered at the cenotaph, then still a temporary wooden plaster structure, had made the street almost impassable. Flowers had to be passed over people's heads to be placed on the monument. Then, as the 11 chimes of Big Ben began to ring out, the start of the silence was heralded by the firing of maroon signalling rockets from fire stations in the centre of London and from 100 police stations in the outer boroughs. The explosion of the rockets startled, startled flocks of pigeons, sending them flying into the air. And remarkably, the noise of their flapping wings was the only sound to be heard. Across London, the scene was repeated. In Trafalgar Square, the fountains had been turned off for the duration of the silence, and crowds stood motionless. At the Olympia Exhibition Centre, the normal business of the motor show <coughs> was halted, and the only sound in the vast building was the broken sobs of an elderly man in the gallery. The Lutine bell, traditionally rung to signify the sinking of a ship, was sounded in Lloyd's of London. In every school, a letter from the king had been read at assembly, and children now stood in silence. So total was the observance that any variation, any behaviour that hinted at normality, appeared extraordinary. One man walked down Tottenham Court Road during the pause, 
with the crowd standing bareheaded and the vehicles motionless, wrote a correspondent. And this one man, striding along in the middle of the road, impressed my friend as the strangest apparition he had ever seen. Court proceedings were suspended to honour the dead, and a smart solicitor in our growth, representing two men accused of running a gaming house, took the opportunity to suggest that this might be an appropriate moment for clemency. His argument was sufficiently persuasive that the charges against his client were dropped. It was perhaps the greatest moment of national unity there had ever been, and then the maroons were fired again, and the silence came to a close. The following day, Sir Arthur Steele Maitland, a Conservative MP for Birmingham, said, One of the most effective things he had ever heard was faintly, but clearly, the sound of the last post, he supposed from the Cenotaph in Whitehall. He was wrong. There were no buglers to play the last post at the Cenotaph that morning, but there were elsewhere. Those arranging the official commemorations may not have felt the need for the call to be sounded. Others clearly did. The enormity of the silence, the eternity of those two minutes required release, demanded a moment of cathartic exhalation to channel the emotions of the nation. The last post could provide that purge. There was, though, no consistency. In Axminster, it signalled the end of the silence. In Tamworth, the last post started the silence with the call of reveil to, in, to, sorry, reveil to conclude. At Olympia, another call altogether, stand fast, was used. The nature of remembrance had yet to be agreed. The poppy, the tomb of the unknown warrior, the festival of remembrance had yet to appear. But the last post had a longer history than any of these and was already established in public culture. Over the last half century, it had been transformed from its status as just one of dozens of bugle calls heard every day in army camps to become almost a sacred anthem, an inclusive symbol of mourning. Armistice Day would complete that journey. On that first commemoration of Armistice Day, it was heard most movingly of all in the afternoon. Two hours after the silence, an unofficial ceremony at the Cenotaph drew attention to the survivors, to those still living with their wounds, a parade of several hundred disabled ex-servicemen, the blind accompanied by sightless companions, the crippled on crutches. This touching spectacle brought tears to the eyes of many of the onlookers, it was reported. As the band played Chopin's Marche Venebre, two of the men stepped forward to lay a wreath on the monument. Then came a bagpipe lament, and finally, the playing of the last post on solo bugle. Thank you, Jenny and Vern. Thank you to everyone that's taken part in this first part of the evening. Um, tea and coffee is now served in the Bluebird Room. We are running a little bit late, so I'll come and get you. But by all means, bring your drinks back in and uh, we'll get you back for the second half. Thank you very much indeed.